Welcome to my new video series on DNA. Where to test, how to test, and how to analyze the results. It's the year 2021, and you can pay 50 or 100 bucks to a company, they'll send you a kit, you either spit into it or swab your mouth, and then you send it back to them. They run it through, genotype your DNA, and then match you with other people who share significant quantities of chromosomal markers. More than anything, DNA testing is a useful tool for determining who your genetic relatives are. And when used in conjunction with a really good paper trail, it can even lead to breakthroughs on brick walls. But DNA testing Jewish ancestry can be a confusing, oftentimes frustrating process. The long-standing cultural practice of Jews marrying only other Jews has led to a unique set of genetic markers some which can't really be distinguished so easily uh, between relatives and other people of that ethnicity. And it's for that reason it can be really, really difficult to determine exactly how you're related to somebody that you share a DNA match with. I'm Yona Paley, a professional genealogist, and today on Genealogy is Fun, we're going to be talking about the basics of autosomal DNA testing for Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. The first question you may be asking is what is autosomal DNA testing? Now to get into this, you have to understand that there are three main types of DNA tests offered by the big companies. So the first is Y DNA testing, which traces the Y chromosome, which is passed down exclusively from father to son. And then there's mitochondrial DNA testing, which as you've guessed, traces the mitochondria within the cells, and that's passed down from a mother to her children. But the third type of DNA testing, which is by far the most popular, is autosomal DNA testing. So you have 23 sets of chromosomes, and one set of those chromosomes are your sex chromosomes, which determine if you're biologically male or female. And of course, for men, you would have a Y and an X, and for people who are born women, there would be two X chromosomes. But what about your other 22 sets of chromosomes? Those are your autosomal ones. And those are passed down across many generations on many different lines. The benefits of testing your 22 pairs of autosomal chromosomes is the information is passed down from both of your parents. So you're able to get a decent amount of information from all of the branches of your close by family. Now, due to a process called recombination, the amount of DNA you share with ancestors is random. So you share about 50-50 with each parent. They get 50% from each of their parents. But by the time you get back, you know, three, four, five, or more generations, the percentage you share from each individual ancestor becomes increasingly random. So it's pretty easy to tell if you're a first, second, third cousin of someone, but by the time you start getting a little bit further back, fourth, fifth, sixth, the percentage chance that you share any DNA with them whatsoever starts going down. So it's not so easy to tell whether or not you're somebody's fourth cousin, fifth cousin, sixth cousin. And in fact, by the time you start getting to fifth and sixth and seventh cousins, the chances become more likely than not that you don't share any significant DNA with them whatsoever. But you will share some DNA with some of them. There are a lot of companies offering at-home DNA tests. So which one should you choose? Now, I'm a big believer in getting the most value for your money possible. So this is the strategy I use, but I wanna throw in a couple of caveats first. Caveat number one is that there is no DNA test 
commercially available that's inherently better than the others among the large companies. They're all pretty much the same, but the question we're gonna be dealing with is which one's gonna get you the biggest number of quality genetic matches that you can try to trace and find genetic relatives. The second caveat is that not every country has the same laws with regards to DNA tests. So there are some places where you might not be able to get a test from a certain company, somewhere DNA testing is completely illegal. So I'm going to this video assuming you're in a place like the US where the laws are pretty low maintenance with regards to where you can get a DNA test. So where should you test? Ancestry, 23andMe, Family Tree DNA, My Heritage, maybe Living DNA. I recommend going with Ancestry for a simple reason. And that is that Ancestry has by far the biggest database of users. As of this year, they have some 20 million people who have taken a DNA test compared to the number two company, 23andMe, where about 12 million people have tested. The other reason I recommend going with Ancestry is that you can download your data and upload it to most of the other sites. So you can upload your data to uh, MyHeritage, Family Tree DNA, GEDmatch, Living DNA, and even a couple of others. But what you can't do is take one with one of the other companies and then upload it to Ancestry. Now, the same rule goes with 23andMe. So if you test with 23andMe, you can upload to most of the others, not Ancestry, but you can't do it the other way around. So really the ultimate way to max out your DNA tests would be to test with both Ancestry and 23andMe and then upload them to all the other sites. But given that most people don't wanna buy more than one DNA test, if you wanna get the biggest number of matches for the least amount of money, your best bet is testing with Ancestry first, uploading it to most of the other ones, and you'll have access to every single database with the exception of 23andMe. Now that you know where to test, the question is, who should you test? Remember when I said earlier how every generation the amount of DNA shared gets smaller and smaller? It's for this reason why it's so important for you to test the oldest people in your family first. So if you have living grandparents, great aunts and uncles, even parents, uncles and aunts, it's always better if they're willing to take a test to test them first. Think about it. If you have living parents or uncles and aunts and you have them take a test, they're going to match with people that you probably won't or you'll match much smaller. So having two parents take a DNA test essentially takes out the need for you to ever take a test because they're already gonna have all the DNA information that you have within you, but you only have half of each of the ones that they have. So what I would definitely recommend is first figure out who the furthest back people in your family are that will take a test, and then you can fill some of the gaps by, let's say, taking a test yourself. Some of the biggest breakthroughs I've had with regards to DNA have come from a test that my grandmother and my great aunt took. And this is because they were able to match with people that my DNA simply couldn't reach. Which brings us to the question of how do you analyze the results? Now, as you can see, I have 171,000 DNA matches, and this is just on one website alone. Now, I'm not actually related to all 171,000 of these people, at least not in a way that would ever be able to be figured out. It's very uncommon for people without Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry or some other endogamous group to have this many matches. So when you're starting out, it can seem overwhelming and feel like a nightmare trying to wade through and figure out which of these matches are good quality and which ones are not good quality. The average amount of centimorgans shared between third cousins is about 53. 
But what if somebody is your fifth, sixth, and seventh cousin, all on different branches of the family, but related to you in, at the same time? And this is the nightmare of endogamy, because you could be somebody's 10th cousin six different times, and all that DNA gets added together and makes it look like you share more than you really do. So it's gonna say that you're, oh, maybe a fourth or fifth cousin, but what you really are is an extremely, extremely distant cousin multiple times. I'm not gonna go into all the details of how to sort through DNA matches and stuff like triangulation because I'm gonna save that for a more advanced video. But for now, I'm gonna give you an easy tip that you can follow when looking through your DNA matches. And that is, if you are part of an endogamous group like Ashkenazi Jews, don't focus exclusively on the total amount of DNA shared. Don't look at the centimorgans and say, well, I share 50 with this person, so I must be a third cousin. Take a look at the largest segments of the match. Largest segments are really useful because if you're closely related with somebody, you'll probably share bigger segments than if you weren't. So if you have like two or three segments over 20 centimorgans each, totaling up to 70 or 80, that's a much better match than if you have um, segments of seven, but you have 12 of them totaling up to a big number. Now this is easier to do on some websites versus others. So MyHeritage, Family Tree DNA, 23andMe, and GEDmatch all have what are called chromosome browsers, where you can take a look at the actual amounts that you share per chromosome with a DNA match. On Ancestry.com, it's a little more tricky because they don't have a chromosome browser, but they do have a function where you can see what the largest segment that you share is with the person. So you're not able to sort by it, but you are able to see what the largest segment is. Ancestry.com right now doesn't have as good tools for analyzing your DNA matches as some of the other sites. But as a trade-off, as we said before, it has the largest database. So that's definitely going to outweigh a lot of its shortcomings. Now, I want to close off with just one final note, and this is something to keep in mind, that DNA testing is only as useful as how good your paper trail is. So that means that the majority of your efforts should always be toward building your tree using good records and sources. And then you're gonna be able to more easily figure out how different DNA matches are related to you. Sometimes you'll have a seemingly good quality match sitting around on your list for a long time and it won't be until you solve a paper record breakthrough where you'll suddenly have that aha moment and realize exactly why you DNA match with that person. The better your tree is, the more of those moments you're gonna have. So that wraps up the basics of autosomal DNA testing for Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. If you like this video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time.